And so I really drew out here in the corner what habitat is. Habitat is five things. I'm a wildlife biologist by education and training. And so it's second nature to me to think about habitat and what living things need, but food, water, air, space, and shelter. And underground space and shelter are the most sought after commodities, of course, because we're underground. It's, it's in a cave. I mean, how much space is there? It depends. Depends on who else is living there and, and what's, what ecosystem engineer has gone through that space beforehand. And then new organisms can move into that space. And how stable that space is really depends on what organism was before there and how we manage the soil for that, that structure, whether it's degraded or whether it's healthy and, and covered up in all those the soil principles. So with that, next slide. Um, we need a measurement of success. So as we manage soil, it's really important that we monitor how healthy our soil is. And so asking that question, is the soil healthy, um, really depends. Um, there's a lot of physical properties of the soil that dictate whether a soil can function at its, you know, the way you think it should. There's some heavy, heavy clay soil that, you know, inherently are very slow at infiltrating water and pond water quite easily. And there's sandy soils that don't store water. And so the inherent physical properties of your soil really do matter on how it can potentially perform at its peak. And those, those four or five soil forming factors, time, aspect, parent material, climate, and biology. Notice biology is, again, the soil forming factor, the things living there. And so what lives there really does matter. Management should support biological activities to store carbon and nitrogen and build habitat. The only things that build space and shelter underground naturally and sustainably are things that live there. We can't do that with metal and we can't do it sustainably or repeatedly. And so it's, uh, it's really important that we manage to support that, the biological activities. So when we, when we are habitat managers, when we're managing the habitat with the soil health principles, we really are managing for that soil structure. It's the things, the space and the shelter. That's what we're really sheltering and protecting with soil health management is the space and shelter. Because when there's space and shelter, then things can move in, we can proliferate, we can diversify, and we can, we can generate more and more of those healthy relationships. So a structure equals functioning healthy soil. And so really the question that I ask when I enter a system is, is there proper soil structure in this soil profile? And that's something that the NRCS is really good at identifying. We have soil scientists like Elizabeth in the back here who can teach and train our employees on how to, to see soil structure and understand what's the native potential of that soil. And then what do we find in your system? Is there, is there some weak modifier or is it completely degraded and it's massive or blocky? And so we need to look at that soil structure and understand whether it's healthy or not. So next slide, we'll move into some faster paced slides here. Uh, the common structural problem in Nebraska, a tillage induced root restrictive compaction layer. When we till the soil, there's a bottom end to where that, that metal is moving. And when we shear the soil off, it smears the soil, it compacts the soil at that point, and it creates a compaction issue density change. And that density change impacts the root tip as it moves through the soil profile. It can only exert so much pressure. It's called the rooting pressure tolerance. Root pressure tolerance is determined by the species and kind of what kind of root it is um, also in, in changes. So when we talk about uh, most hybridized or, or you know, commodity or, or food crops, most of those are some sort of hybrid. And a lot of that hybridization removes the rooting pressure tolerance. So some of our cash crops um, lack the root pressure tolerance necessary to go through higher density soils. And when we see lateral growing roots, we know that we're preventing productivity, um, acquisition of resources, and just the proliferation of the soil environment to develop those relationships. And so this picture over here shows this corn plant down to four inches. I find that a lot in big broad scale farming, four inch flower pot, basically. We're growing corn and soybeans in four to six inches of soil. And we think romantically that it should just be the whole soil profile. But trying to grow a crop in 
physically forage the soil is quite demanding. Um, it requires a lot of resources. A lot, oftentimes, irrigation is the limiting factor. So um, I say roots, not iron. Uh, we can fix that problem with cover crops and non hybridized species, deep taprooted species. A lot of the species that we grow in gardening systems have the capacity, the higher rooting pressure tolerance. And a lot of those species are species we use in cover crop blends. And so it's, it's not unfamiliar to a lot of gardeners and, and small scale agriculture to, to see some deep taprooted species that can really flow through those compaction layers and improve that soil structure. So I'll um, go to the next slide. Um, soil health planning in a high tunnel. That's something that I just endeavored to do on my own in 2012 to 16. And we, we had a thousand square foot high tunnel that we grew cut flowers in. I did a no-till system in that high tunnel. Um, I established these growing beds and really had a controlled traffic system. Controlled traffic is something that I'm a huge proponent of. The first time you drive on the soil, 90% of the potential damage is done the first trip. So when you drive on it once, it's done. You compacted the soil as much as you're going to compact it. It's not like maybe five times later I can stop. It's the first time fully loaded with a wheelbarrow load, we're compacting the soil. So this main center travel lane, you know, I reduced it down to two and a half feet or so and tried to keep that as small as possible, just wide enough to get a wheelbarrow down. And this is the most valuable real estate that I own because I invested in a high tunnel over the top of it and a drip system to provide water and weed barrier to help the, the weed management. And I needed it to every inch of that, every square foot to produce. And so thinking profitably, I, I read a lot about different commodity crops and vegetables and, and food production and realized that I could probably hit a niche market with my scale and my time that, that landed me growing cut flowers. And I, I think it was really fun. It was neat to explore. And we, we made a lot of money off the acreage. And so it was a, it was a valuable enterprise. Um, as we began to look at how I managed the soil and how long living plants were growing there, I really wanted diversity. So we did successional planting and we tried to follow um, deep tapid crop, crops with fibrous crops. And thinking about root structure really drove some of my crop rotations more than even some of the, the crop types in a, in a single season. And so trying to diversify the root structure was, was fun. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, lessons learned really that each bed is your crop field. You need to think of that single bed as a crop field and how you manage that in a year, year to year, and in a single year really is its own little individual unit. That, that bed doesn't need to wait for the bed three beds away to get harvested for me to roll back the wheat barrier and plant a cover crop. I should plant the cover crop at the time that the first chance I have in the bed that's harvested. And so thinking of it, you know, here we are planting bulbs and here's my fall cover crop right next to it. So thinking of each bed individually really helped me conceive of these time frames that I didn't have to wait for all the tomatoes to be harvested before I tore out my garden, right? That concept is hard for us. It's a paradigm shift. Um, and so I asked folks, where's your you know, brassicas? Where's the, the spring crops? And do you have four foot tall oats? in midsummer because you should you could plant oats there really really quick right after harvest cover that ground up and have a completely different crop um, also where's your bean field right after bean harvest um, green beans are can be taken out and or you can let them grow a second you know third and fourth flush but if you want to tear them out you can certainly plant a cover crop there and there's some good warm season cover crops that can grow good the other thing that i learned is um, trying to make $25 a square foot in your high tunnel is, is the, the target that I hung on my wall. And it took a lot of ingenuity. We had to get really creative on how to stack enterprises. And so planting some bulbs in the center of that high tunnel where the ground didn't freeze, I didn't have to remove the bulbs. So that saved me a lot of time and labor and an investment in that bulb. And then I could get a proliferation. I have a single large stem and I have some smaller stems that I could use for different sources, different sale purposes. But I put those bulbs in the center between the drip system and my growing area was in, on the drip system line. 
And so I could plant annuals in between those bulb rows and not disturb them during the growing season. And so just intercropping like that and, and having a diversity of, of systems that are right on top of each other was kind of neat. As soon as we covered that up, I covered that with straw and wheat and we grew a flush of wheat in there. I actually sold the wheat for cut flowers. Um, wheat is a really great thrower uh, foliage and it has a lot of agronomic appeal. And so it's, it's pretty fun to grow that and, and cut it while it's green. Um, and you can see I kept the, the travel lane covered with wheat straw as well, keeping that soil covered. It can armor the soil, keep it healthy, keep it from getting compacted in the first place, but also just help the, it not dry out the bed right next to it. You know, that travel lane doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly pavement. It, it needs to, to function within the systems. Um, this bed right here, I grew that cover crop on, and then the next spring on the next slide, I think you can see, um, is this bed right here with these snapdragons and, and bells of Ireland and whatnot down there. Um, but we grew some really vigorous, big, large, healthy snapdragons that, that sold fine. I was really happy with the system. I uh, terminated that by rolling the weed barrier down right over the top of that kind of frost kill cover crop. And we, we thought it was a, a good adventure. We began rotating that through the whole high tunnel. And that was kind of 2012 when I started. And then I landed this job in 2016. So then I moved to Lincoln and we kind of got away from this acreage and in, into some other acreages. And we're still endeavoring to get involved in cut flowers. But we grew a lot of different varieties and had fun doing it. So the next slide there. Um, a soil health management system, I think, really depends on how you want to manage the weeds. Um, but tillage can't be your tool, in my opinion. It should be the, the what's the, the illustrated phrase? Not the rule, but the exception, not the rule. The exception, not the rule. And this weed barrier is a woven fabric that I really liked because it allows water to permeate through it. So it doesn't pond water. And I can, I, I burnt these holes in it so it didn't fray. That was another really clutch move. And then um, I, I guess the next slide um, later. Yeah, that was 2012. This is 2017. I'm still using the same weed barrier still today, um, 2023. And so it's now over 10 years old, working fine. And you just got to roll it up, put it in the shed during the winter and take good care of it. Don't let the mice get in it, things like that. Don't hit it with the lawnmower. That's probably ruined the most of it. Um, so this weed berry really allows me a lot of opportunities because I can either weed eat that cover crop to terminate it in the spring and then roll the weed berry out. And then I just use a little hand trowel to like sever the roots and kill any plants that are in that four inch hole. And then the rest of it just kind of grows. Sometimes something will poke its head through one of those holes and I just snip it off and move on. Um, it's not a limiting factor. If, and it's only a weed if you don't want it to be there. And so I really thought, you know, this cover crop is going to provide some synergy and I'm not really competing for water or fertilizer in my system or managing it in such a way it's so small that it's not going to be pristine. So I really like to point out that in a no-till system, this is, this is not tillage, this is compost. I applied compost over the top of that cover crop and, and really uh, blackened the soil, right? but it's not, it's, it's, it's compost from the city of Lincoln. And then I covered that up with that weed barrier and kept it off the soil surface and just used that as kind of a mulch for a season and then it incorporated into the soil on its own. You don't have to till everything in to create new soil. Let the soil ecology create and transport and relocate materials. And soil is stacking. It's just layer upon layer. And it, and it moves down as it gets digested and consumed and utilized. And then it kind of grows up too. It's funny. The soil mixes itself and, and grows. So the term that I like to use is called farming dirty. You know, it takes some paradigm shift to get off of pristine manicured system. And if we can choose to farm dirty, quote unquote, then we can kind of get familiar or more accustomed to what you're gonna see here. So click through these slides, I'll just say go. So that's the compost stuff, go ahead. 
there I am uh, rolling some weed berry out. So we just roll weed berry out when we need to plant. And so we planted some brassicas there and then on and on. So go ahead. And there's those brassicas growing. And you can see some of the oats came through that, that or I think it's sort of right there, came through that weed barrier. And we're just going to clip that off, move to the season. So go ahead. There's some sort of rye that I let grow clear to head. Um, you can go another time. There's some raised beds that I had um, for some root crops. We had some heavy, heavy clay there. It was kind of a developed subdivision that we had initially moved in into Lincoln. And so all the topsoil had been removed. It was really ugly. And so I, I built this soil up with a lot of compost material and it, it became really healthy. Um, so right here, you can see this is harvested. Um, go ahead. I rolled that weed barrier back. It was bare ground underneath of it already. All the biology had consumed that, that compost that I'd applied the year before. And so I put down cover crop seed and then I put lawn clippings right down. That's the only time I bag my grass is when I need some clippings for, for gardening. Otherwise, I just mulch it into the grass. Um, go ahead. Put, so there's a cover crop coming up. There's a warm season cover crop clicking in. There it is again, you can click and click another time. So it looks pretty ugly, you know, I'm, and I'm gardening right in there. You can see the tomatoes are gone now. I planted another cover crop over there after tomato harvest, go ahead. There's some snow on that. We still had some cabbages and stuff hanging on. They just survived the winter, go ahead. And there's that cover crop midwinter. That's November 18th, there's December, go ahead. Um, there's February, and so, there, it's looking pretty ugly. There, I dumped my household compost right onto that, that brassica patch that didn't have a cover crop. So in light of not having a cover crop in that little area, I dedicated my little compost facility to cover that ground up that year. So go ahead. You can see how immediately there started to be some, some life there. It just comes to, comes alive. Go ahead. Um, that's after, that's in April. So right at planting, go ahead. And there's the summer picture, August of 19. So we skipped four months there. And so then we grew you know, those uh, vine crops in that area where that cover crop did really well. Um, trying to, to grow one of our biggest pest management problems in our healthiest soil. Because a healthy plant can resist some pest damage and, re and you know, go to, to fruition and grow a, a crop for me. So go ahead and keep going. There it is, I took out those vine crops and, and again, planted a cover crop right away, go ahead. And there it is coming up in October of 19. That's, that's kind of the end. And you can see, I rolled that weed barrier back to the center because I still had crops in the rest of it. So even a whole lane of cover of weed barrier, you don't have to wait for the whole lane to get used up. You can just roll back and leave it sit, go ahead. Um, and you can see kind of the difference uh, between the, the successions and where the, the grass clippings just disappears and the cover crop comes up. Go ahead. And there's uh, the cover crop. It had sorghum, it had oats, rapeseed, radish, and turnips. Oh, and flax, buckwheat, camelina, soybeans, field peas, cow peas, lentils, and clover. And the clover stayed for quite a while. I like that. So go ahead. Um, and there's a, a snapshot of it in the raised bed there of kind of every species that I just mentioned is all right there in that one picture. Go ahead. So at this point, I'm going to flip over to my live presentation here, and maybe we can just close this. Um, one more picture, and I, I guess it's just my contact information. So feel free to reach out to City Sprouts if you need this. How do I close this oh, shutter? Oh, there it is. There we go. Is that all right? There we go. So I'm going to have to get some time to get here. We've got about five minutes, maybe. So tonight I've got these monoliths. I don't know if you can see this online over here. Maybe Megan will move the camera here. Yeah. Um, these are shelf stable monoliths, they're, they're big soil blocks that are glued, they're shelf stable, and they portray some different management plots from a UNL research farm called Rogers Memorial Farm. And it's over 40 years old now, it was started in 81. And so it's 
42 years old. And it's been 40 years away from this system. This is the conventional tilt system that was in place evidently when they started. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it was for sure some sort of tillage. Um, but they adopted this system in 81. It's fall plowing, spring disking, and summer, summer cultivation. And so this system has been held in place for 40 years. And I collected this at its 40th anniversary. And you can see the crop roots are growing down through these cracks. They're not proliferating into the aggregates. This is sort of a light gray color. It's uh, pretty chunky blocks. And um, there's not really roots on the bottom. All the roots come out the sides. They're really top dominant in the top of that system because there's a plow pan that I'll show over here. Um, the other thing that I really like to point out is um, corn crop puts out brace roots and the brace roots here are about an inch and a half above the soil surface. And so the comparison is this one, which is 40 years of no-till farming. No-till and controlled traffic. This one had a kind of chocolate cake or brownie appearance, darker brown. And it really has roots proliferating clear through the profile. They come out the side. It's, it's not so top dominant. And what's really amazing is that there's no brace roots. The brace roots are actually at the soil surface. And so that means the growing point and the first set of roots is clear down here at depth. And at Rogers Farm, they actually plant corn at three inches of depth so that it grows up through and it has a chance to root in the soil profile. Uh, that's a really big change in management perspective. And those brace roots then become really helpful and productive uh, towards the, the, the yield. Um, but it's also interesting that when that same seeding depth here forces the growing point out of the soil, and so it grows up, not down. And so that root is actually just kind of staying there and then the crop goes up. Whereas this one stays and then the roots grow down, not forcing it out of the ground. So this no-till system uh, lends itself to keeping the soil covered, disturbing the soil not at all. And then we have a cash crop in this one of corn and soybeans only, no cover crops in this one. And um, then, yeah, so that's living root and diversity, um, but not so much of that, right? But it took, and it's been 40 years to achieve this, but I can still flip around here and see kind of some damage some soil structure issues from that historic plowing. After 40 years of management, we still have this historic damage. And so it's kind of like a scar on your, on your skin. Mm -hmm. it, it can heal, but it's still kind of apparent. And it takes a lot to remodel a scar and make it go away. And it's possible if you rub a scar and really stretch it and move it, you can get it to remodel and, and make it go away. It takes a lot of exercise. That's same thing in soil. So this soil, although darker and healthier and has a huge 10 times infiltration rate of, the, of this soil, it still has this historic disc pan. And so that's, that's really shocking to me because it's, it's really healthy soil, but yet that's where cover crops and some more diversity of root systems can really help that soil go the, the next mile in its, in its healing process. So this is the, the till soil. You know, it's got bare ground. Um, this crust is what's formed on top of it. That crust is, is what's common to like mud puddles. You might see it cracking in those geometric shapes. Um, soil crusting is really uh, not helpful for ag agronomy and productivity is limited by soil crusting, a lot of emergence issues. Um, this layer right here in treatment, this is uh, kind of compaction, traveling, and also from that cultivation event. That sweep, that field sweep that's at the surface, light disking, light, light tillage. You know, where does that mean the, the compaction back? It's up high in the soil system. And so we actually have some soybean roots that are growing laterally at literally two inches. That's that's really high in the soil for roots to be growing and searching for resources. So that's the, the two-inch layer. Then right down here, there's this curvy layer. That's the scallop disk blades that compact that ground. Um, that has a, a real impact on root structure. In fact, back here, you can see some roots poking out. And the novel thing about this is it's still mobile plowed. And so that old plow pan 
like a chalkboard. And it really is so dense that it can hold that plow. Um, plowing depends on a plow pan to keep it up in the soil profile. Otherwise, the plow bogs down and it'll get stuck. And so they had to establish the plow pan as they used the plow in order to make it functional. So the horse could actually go through the field and, and be efficient at the, the plowing at pinch. So it's, it's really interesting that it's right there on that B horizon. There's a, a really straight uh, plow compaction pan there that's very, very evident in the field. So as I stack this all back up, we recognize that that's a lot of compassion layers for a route to go through and a lot of resource concerns for, for productivity to occur and, and function through. So I'll set that back over there. What's cool is that having the opportunity to work with Paul Yaza on the research farm, I was able to go and dig some soil out. And this is the same soil. Um, it's it's Arvin still loam. And it's this is a, that conventional till completely damaged that gray color. And this is the, the undisturbed with living roots and a lot of that soil aggregation, that dark soil color. And so when I put this in water, this is called an aggregate stability test. This is something you can do at home in just a glass. You can, you can suspend, you can put it right down on the bottom and you can even watch the soil and how it interacts with water. Um, we depend on soil to stay stable when wet. That's really when we need the soil to stay. And that's that function that I talked about that we assume will happen every day. And so when I stick this in, in the water, it's really interesting to see the air and the water trade places. That's how infiltration happens. Air and water have to trade places for it to, to successfully infiltrate and move into the soil profile. That soil crust prevents air movement. That's why crusting is so bad. And so as water begins to infiltrate into the soil pads, then we see the, the structural integrity of those dirt pods, those soil pads, aggregates themselves, withstand the water pressure, in this case, or not so much here. And we'll see slaking or exploding of soil as it begins to weaken and diminish, and that's the nature of, of that poor aggregate stability. So downstream from that, literally, we can see this cloudy water and, and we see brown flood events all the time and we think that's normal. We think that's what it should look like, but that's not necessarily so. And if we had far less soil erosion, then we could have a lot cleaner flood water. It could really change our ecology and prevent sedimentation and a whole bunch of uh, ecological problems downstream from here. So as we think about where that soil comes from, remember that aggregate stability is a function of the soil to stay stable when wet. And so this really is those two soils. I'm gonna turn these around. I guess I got these backwards for the record. So the no-till kind of undisturbed soil and that, that conventional disturbed soil. I've got the same two soils here. This one's still rolling around. It's got aggregates in it. And it's that healthy undisturbed soil. This is that crusted soil, that, that poor aggregate stability soil. So it's already wet in these jars. And I'm gonna pour another inch of water on these and just see what happens. Um, these are super wet. They've been wet for months. And so the, the healthy soil, it, it takes a beating, but it keeps on going. Water still moves through it and it'll begin dripping. Um, it's really intriguing that it can continue to function through time. And that's the problem with winter presentations. I use it a lot during the winter, but I can't go out and collect new soil. And so you can see that the water level here is stacked really high and this has infiltrated a lot and it's starting to drip already. Now it's continued capacity to function is getting less and less and less as time goes on, as I abuse it and, and don't grow a plant in it. And so unfortunately that's uh, gonna drip a lot for a long time, but the neat thing, or not neat, but intriguing thing is that this isn't dripping and the water's ponded on the soil surface. And that's what that crust is good for, it ponds water. And so we depend on that to, to impound water in ponds and we can pack the bottom of that pond so it doesn't, it doesn't you know, soak that water in, but that's not really what we want in a, in a farming system. 
So next and least, last but not least, we've got these two uh, soil cutters, these uh, stainless steel cutters. And I took these straight out of the field. These are the, the no-till system versus the conventional till system. And we can see what happens when this happens, really the aggregate instability and the lack of water infiltration happen all at once. And so we're gonna set this rain cloud back on here and put an inch of rain on our fields and see what happens when we, when we rain on it. And so right away, you can see a pretty big difference in runoff amounts. And that's showing the infiltration rate of the no-till system. It's actually four inches per hour in the field that can infiltrate into those no-till plots. The, the tillage plots are actually 0.4 inches per hour. So 10 times less infiltration. So when we get an inch of rain on these two crop fields, how beneficial is that inch of rain to the tillage system? Not a we call them, that wasn't a beneficial rain. It came too fast. It, can rain really come too fast? Or is it just simply a management issue and an infiltration you know, impairment? And so, I've seen soil that can infiltrate 18, 36 inches per hour. I've witnessed it with my own eyes. You can dump a five gallon bucket of water and it just disappears. It doesn't pollen. You know, that's the power of healthy soil. We could withstand an entire hurricane event on this field and four inches in an hour would soak in. So it's pretty amazing that that water goes right through this system into the aquifer and into the soil profile below this and then potentially a lot more water storage through that soil profile. This is the top three inches. So there's a lot of soil underneath of it and it's not immediately connected to the aquifer. But if it does, and, and it does move through the soil relatively fast, um, it's filtering and buffering because of all the carbon that's stored there, carbon to filter. And so it's really intriguing to see that in place. If you ever get a chance to go to Rogers Farm, they do have a field day in August. And it's, it's really neat to see uh, the impacts of compounding management. So that's what I've got tonight. Um, I'll leave some of the conservation stuff to Jason if you want to start talking. I think we're, we're making hay. Well, I've seen that several times and I've always loved this. I'm a visual learner. It's just a great representation of soil health. So thank you, Aaron, for putting that on. Well said. Um, <clears throat> But anyhow, here's all my list of hats again. We're not going to talk about those. But my name is Jason McCauley. That's J A S O N M C capital C A U L E Y. And my number is 402 404 7156. If you ever want to call me, I'm uh, kind of a personal guy. Sit down and talk your ear off, probably. But anyway, um, I'm supposed to talk about practices that we might be able to help you with uh, on your operation. And so my, my detail as an urban conservationist has really opened my eyes as to what we can do with people uh, on all kinds of scales, because I'm very accustomed to very large scale operations. And so I've adjusted my lens, so to speak, to see smaller operations. And I just think it's awesome, you know, and I'm standing closer than any of you, and I can't read that. <laughs> but the point is, we got a whole bunch of stuff we can help you with, okay? And so, um, really, my role and the role of the NRCS is to come out, uh, and, and this is kind of the planning phase, and Brock will talk about different phases a little bit later on, but I'm, I'm really wanting to help you facilitate uh, what's going to be best for your operation. And what can what can make you know take take you to that next level? That's what I tell people. I want to take your operation to that next level. And so, uh, Brock, if you would, one of the things that that Aaron has touched on uh, and and has a lot of experience on is the high tunnel system. Okay, and that's that's basically your opportunity to have a little more. Uh, input, if you will, on your growing season. So we would, this kind of system actually helps you extend your growing season. And I know that's probably one of your, your primary concerns when you're out there. Um, 
you know, it's going to freeze in the fall or it's too cold in the spring. This kind of system can actually um, help you with that. And so when you look at this, um, this is uh, this is a door there. You can see that. And then also those sides in this instance looks like they roll down. Okay. <clears throat> so that helps you with your, your air temperature and that kind of thing. So uh, go ahead, Brock. Great picture of a, of a small scale operation, Rogers, Nebraska. Mr. Brock Johnson, I'm gonna give him a lot of credit on that one for, for working with this producer, but um, small town, what is it, 100, 150 people, something like that. And yeah, so this guy, Beaver's Produce has really taken and ran with it. And, and you can see how beautiful of a crop he has. And um, <clears throat> this is the kind of stuff I'd like to see help you all with, okay, Brock? Just another view um, of a high tunnel system, kind of what I want you to focus on in this one. It, it says sprinkler irrigation, where we do uh, micro irrigation, smaller stuff, kind of more on the ground, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> just want you to think about it in, in, in this, this term, in this perspective, when you put a piece of plastic over the ground, what are you doing? In a way, you're kind of restricting the water that could naturally fall on the ground, right? And so with an irrigation system, we kind of help alleviate that, that problem with uh, no water hitting the ground. And it's, it's a little more regulated, if you will. <clears throat> this is drip tape uh, on, a, on a frame system. And... Um, this one is a rain garden. You'll see that there's a structure kind of in the back and really it, it's, it's a pond to capture water and sediments and whatnot. And it's just a way to kind of help prevent things um, from occurring down the drainage from where this would naturally, naturally go. And so, and, uh, <clears throat> so this is a composting facility. Aaron mentioned that in his presentation that he had compost. And so this could be a system that you might be able to use that we could potentially provide funding for. Um, I, think, uh, I think that was it, isn't it? Yeah, all right. So thank you. very brief, but thank you all for your time. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brock. Thanks, There's actually uh, one quick question on the high tunnel. Um, Someone's asking, um, they're wondering if assistance is granted to a certain size of production. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so the maximum size of a high tunnel system <clears throat> that we would cost share on is 2,160 square feet. And so if you lay uh, a tape on the ground, if you will, that's 70 feet long by 32 feet wide. Fantastic question. So thank you. Brock? Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Jason. So my name is Brock Johnson, and I'm, like I said, I'm the outreach coordinator for NRCS. And I listened to Aaron's story tonight about how he uh, was engaged in farming growing up. I grew up in Cumming County, up in Beamer, Nebraska, a small village there in Northeast Nebraska. And I can remember my uncles all farmed. And so I get to go farm with them conventionally. Um, on weekends and things like that. When I was about eight years old, my dad um, had about three old vacant lots in, in town and we started a little nursery. He bought a tree spade in, in 1978. And we planted uh, three or 400 blue spruce. And I just love working with trees and they still have that little nursery to this day. But, you know, my dad never really considered himself a farmer. And uh, I, I thought there would be 15, 20 people in here, but I'd say by show of hands, are you a farmer? So are you guys farm? Raise your hands, yes or no? Yeah? No? Yeah, so we're kind of lukewarm. I don't know if you can give responses on there. Can you give me a thumbs up online if you're a farmer? React to that, give us a thumbs up. And the reason I ask this is because, uh, you know, gardening and farming in the 2018 farm bill, we were able to change where we could put a farm number and materialistically participate in somebody's farm. 
And I ask that question because a lot of us think we're not farming, um, but in fact we are. And I know I work with a lot of beginning farmers, a lot of vegetable producers now. And eventually, if you want to start an entrepreneurial system, you start making money on your enterprise, whether it's cut flowers or vegetables or whatever type of food production and money is exchanging hands, especially at some point, you're going to have to decide uh, the IRS is going to want to cut on that income. And so at some point you decide when you're a farmer to the IRS and you file schedule F for farming. Um, and then you also, at that point, you get, get the benefits of taking the deductions that the IRS allows you to take. And that, uh, that makes you a farmer, a living, breathing farm. So back to my, my family's example, I, you know, my dad would really like to know that he's a farmer, I think, today. And uh, I always tell him that, and I think he's kind of proud of that. And so next slide, Aaron. So urban ag is one of NRCS's top five priorities. Um, with the president, we have now President Biden and our um, chief of NRCS, Terry Cosby. Um, it is one of our top five priorities. We develop micro practices that have been established for urban ag. And Jason talked about that a little bit. And like Jason said, you didn't have to know um, every or see every single practice we have on that list, but you should know there's a lot of them, right? And that should intrigue your or pique your interest in you're going to call somebody like Jason. We have 71 field offices across the state of Nebraska and strike that conversation up about what those practices are and how they can help. Um, we set up a new office of urban ag and innovative production. And the NRCS did. We have 17 brick and mortar facilities across the United States, mostly in the metropolitan areas. Um, for us here in Nebraska, we look at that a little differently. We look at the communities across the state that um, you know, lost population over the years and maybe lost a grocery store and how in food insecure that can make you and the relevance of that. So, it's, you know, we're in Omaha here tonight and I understand the relevance of it here, but it really applies all across the state. And so we call our program the Small Scale and Urban Program. I'm um, just to not turn anybody off to urban when we first talk about what we're doing. We're, NRCS is ramping up and training the public and employees. That's why we're here tonight to talk about this. Um, our employees, we've set up a council of employees across the state that are contact points for small scale and urban agriculture. And innovation, innovative ag is fully supported. So Jason took me on a tour of Northeast Nebraska and he's got a grower there in um, Dakota City that has a hydroponic uh, facility. I think he's grown about 100,000 pounds of beef eater tomatoes, you know, for local grocery stores. So. Um, agriculture comes in all kinds of forms, and back to my original question, are you a farmer? Yes, you are. Next slide. We have direct participation programs. The two flagship programs that we talk about a lot in here are acronyms or the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, the acronym we use for that is ECLIP. The other program we can use is Conservation Stewardship Program, and that acronym we use is CSB. Next slide. And so here's uh, what we're trying to really promote and stress in, in our new customers that we're working with on the small scale. And these are the food issues that we're addressing. So it's food insecurity, food, food scarcity, food deserts, which has been, kind of been renamed here, and I'll go over that in just a second. Um, food sovereignty, culturally relevant foods. Um, there's medicinal foods with that, with culturally relevant foods. And then like Aaron talked about the soil health part of urban soil health is really important. So the nutrient density for food and where that food comes from, the soil that's grown in and the, and the health benefits to you know, having a diet that consists of nutrient dense food. And then you know, food supply chain issues and the pandemic has altered where our food comes from and how it gets here. Um, and so those are all things that we can address with the farm our farm program participation. Next slide. So I looked this up the other day, food desert, what um, is a food desert? And so it's the USDA Economic Research Service coined that phrase. Um, and it, this is from the Food Access Research Atlas. And this slide shows what, they, uh, what constitutes a food desert. Now food desert has been renamed to now low, in, low income and low access areas. And that's not, there's no stigma attached to that. But what the uh, Economic Research Service is trying to do 
is show you that um, it used to be just a flat 10 miles to uh, healthy foods. Well, in Western Nebraska, you just had a green map, you know, because there was long distances, lower population. So now what it's doing, this low income, low access is just a factor of uh, accessibility to transportation, whether it's private or public transportation. And so you can see here in Omaha, we've got areas that I think it says if it's half a mile or greater with no transportation, no access to foods, you can see the eastern part of Omaha here, really high density areas of, of low income, low access to food. Next slide. So food security is defined by the World Food Summit in 96. All people at all times had physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs, food preferences for an active and healthy life. Four dimensions of food security, physical availability, economic and physical access to food, food utilization, per perceived nutrient value of food, for example, and stability of the other three dimensions over time. Next slide. And so the reason I bring this up is because I want to I want to still I want to instill in you what what it takes to be a farmer who who's a farmer and what your possibilities are to, to farm. I brought together um, some documents tonight. I'll send home with you a little pamphlet. But one thing the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production did was came up with a MythBusters fact sheet, and I just have one picture of a slide. Um, if, just to, the myth number one, it says the farm must produce at least $1,000 of ag product to be designated as an ag operation to be eligible for equip. And that myth is debunked over here. It says, no, that is not true. There is no minimum amount of money that you have to make. There is some minimums potentially if you're going to get a loan with the Farm Service Agency, but nothing for NRCS. So I have a copy of that, and I will give that slide to Megan. She can distribute that to all the viewers tonight. And if you're here, you can take home one of the folders with you. Next slide. So this is that slide that um, Jason showed earlier. This is Andrew Beavers, and you can see a little square in the middle of this map. That that little village is Rogers, Nebraska. And Andrew Beavers was, I worked in Skyler, Nebraska, so that's uh, from Omaha. It's about an hour and a half west of here on Highway 30. Rogers, Nebraska is six miles from Skyler. Skyler has a packing plant there that has uh, 31 languages spoken in it. There's about 3,800 full-time employees there. And so I started looking at things a lot differently after talking to Andrew. Um, during the pandemic, Andrew had a job with the State Department of Roads as a drafter. He was had a huge garden in Rogers, and he would come to the uh, CHI hospital in Skyler, and that's where I met him, uh, selling food at a farmer's market. And I asked Andrew if he was a farmer. I go back to that question. And uh, he said, no, I'm not a farmer. I'm just trying to help people out. And he was donating his food, just trying to, we're selling it for a very small price. And the more he described it, he had about half an acre of produce he was growing. I'm like, I think you're a farmer, you know, the more we talked. And so I made a field visit to him and we put a farm number right in town. And we're able to do that today. And if this were Omaha or any other community in the state of Nebraska, um, it's possible to create an entrepreneurial uh, system just like Andrew Beaver did at Beaver's Produce. Next slide. This is again that slide. I don't know who put this slide so together. Probably me. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> I repeated this slide. My slide actually has the population on it. So uh, 104 people. This is a lettuce. Lettuce was something Andrew was uh, making the most money on when he first started. He ended up quitting his job at the Department of Roads now and he's growing full time has about 40 to 50 times the demand for what he can grow. Um, and we partnered with him on a high tunnel, we extended his growing season, and he's purchased three high tunnels on his own. He purchased three uh, dilapidated lots adjacent to it, and then cleaned them off, and he's growing food. Most of that food now is actually going to grocery stores that in eastern Nebraska, small grocery stores that can't get their produce from uh, their distributor. Next slide. So how do you get started with the USDA. Um, Aaron spoke to this a little bit. I think Jason did too. But the very first thing you've got to do is get a farm number. Farm number identifies you as a farmer to USDA. And all that is is really that. It's just an identification number. The USDA is required to do some vetting on the land that enters into the program. And so they have rules for lands that are eligible to participate as the owner. And then each piece of land has an operator or a tenant on that land. 
So the best way to find out about this is to contact your farm service agency. We have 71 offices, I think, or more across the state of farm service agencies. Um, the first thing you do is says to contact you. The second thing, bring some documents. It's going to ask you for a driver's license, proof of proof of ownership, so a recorded deed, a lease, uh, entity status, so an individual or, or an entity could participate. That's all FSA is going to ask you. They're going to set you up as, as a farm number. Okay, if you have that, you can be have a tenancy on that farm. That thing can operate today. Next slide. And so, how do you get? Uh, sometimes we're in the city and we don't even know who the owner is. Maybe the tenant on a farm is farming a plot of land uh, here in Omaha, and the person doesn't speak English very well, or there's some type of barrier to participating. What is that? Well, the very first thing you can do is go to Nebraska GIS works. And I just took a screenshot of this. Every single county in Nebraska is on Nebraska GIS works. And you can identify that owner on that land by doing this. So if you go to the next slide. So this is city sprouts. So I went on Nebraska GIS works and I think Nebraska, that's a horrible blue arrow there I drew. Um, but this, I identified, clicked on this parcel of land here. And it told me who the owner was. And it says right down there, City Sprouts gives me the address, give me a property identification number. Now I've got something to get started with. So next slide. I don't know who owns City Sprouts, that big parcel of land. If I put that identification number, you can see Douglas County is not included in one of the in one of the county. All the blue shaded counties are participating. So not every county participates in deeds online, but some do. Douglas County, that deed was back on that link with the original um, with the original uh, tax parcel. So Douglas County does have it, but the rest of these states, no matter where I'm at, I can click on Nebraska deeds online. I can see the actual deed. So if I got somebody that's not real sure or hesitant to work with NRCS and FSA, I can we can do this with that person right online. Jason works in Dakota City. I mean, he would go, he will help sit down with this person. He'll probably go to some of this stuff and find out that information to help them get signed up at FSA. Next slide. And then again, this is just needs online. It just basically, there's multiple ways to search. In this case, you can go with legal description. If I don't know a name, sometimes that's a great way to do it. Public schools are eligible to get farm numbers. Um, public lands are, they're not always eligible to be the tenant, but there's virtually nowhere you can't put a farm number. Next slide. So once we get to the farm number, there's five steps to assistance with NRCS and that's us. That's when we can help with your conservation planning. And it talks, and we're co-located by the way, with FSA across the state in most all cases. So we're in the same building. Um, once you get the farm number, walk across the hall, you can meet with uh, Jason, their field office employee, and uh, start, you know, you can, They'll do conservation planning with you, meet you on your farm, which might be across the street here in Omaha, if that's your farm. And uh, Jason will be using questions and having comments like resource concerns. And he talked about one being irrigation and things like that. He showed a rain garden. That's a water quality uh, resource concern, right? We don't want nutrients and sediment leaving our little farm, which again, might be in town. And then uh, we have a practice for that. So he might talk about that. Um, he'll do some planning, there's an application. Um, sometimes we get more applications than we have dollars. We rank those applications and we fund them uh, annually, all those contracts. So next slide. Sometimes we don't speak English, right? We're working in an area that we just don't even know what the person is saying. So this is an I speak document and each field office has access to this. And what, they, what this does is uh, if you, you show them each one of these lines and where they pick out their um, their language, they check the box, and then that helps the field office employee be directed to the right way to communicate with this person. Uh, coincidentally, we had uh, some mm -hmm. Afghan refugees that are located to Lincoln. They're Yazidi uh, refugees, and Yazidi is a language on this list. We've actually used this a couple times, so it's a very, very beneficial document. Next slide. And then we have our field office. So this just shows you that once we get the uh, we know what language is spoken. We can break that language barrier down. We have interpretation services here that we can contact directly. Each county in the state is required to have interpretation services through their county courthouse for 
uh, for the Nebraska state law, whatever county law they might need to implement. So there's lots of resources where we can get translation services uh, access. Next slide. And this document is in the uh, handout I have, the folder. This is a really important document because uh, it basically will tell you every source of funding out there for your system. So for example, um, we have some interest right now across the state in mobile preservation systems. And so they're enclosed trailers with dehydrators, uh, canners, pressure cookers, vacuum packers, baggers, and all kinds of equipment to help preserve the food. They can go to different parts of the community. There's grant money for that. This document will tell you where to apply for that grant. And I think that's just one example of a lot of new innovative things that happen. Next slide. And then lastly, I think this is my last slide. Uh, we do have a commitment to equity in our offices. So the statement, it says NRCS advances equity by sustaining fairness in the way we deliver our programs, services, technical assistance within the agency policies and practices. That's from our chief NRCS, Terry Cosby. So, I mean, rest assured that uh, we will do everything in our, in our power to make sure that um, everybody that approaches us for service of some type is treated fairly and equitably. 